our friend, to pray for the report of his soul, and to reflect briefly about his life, Mr. Boniface Bianyema. Mr. Bianyema was known, has been known to me since 1960, the year when he enrolled in the Democratic Party, and the year when I became full-time public secretary of the Democratic Party. I have known him as a true friend, as a, a, a family man, happily married, who, has, who maintained his matrimonial vows to the end, until life separated them with separated him from his wife. I've known him as a Democrat. I've known him as a principled person, strong in character, reliable and dependable. Mr. Benyima was principled, as I've said, resolute. Through all times of difficulties, he would count on his stand based on what he said he believed in. He never wavered. He was a positive force against religious and tribal prejudices. With him and with others like him, the Democratic Party benefited, was able to broaden its religious and ethnic base, and in turn the country benefited and made, and made a very big harvest politically. We have others of similar character and a standard like him at the time who made similar choices. These include the late Professor William Sende Zakajubi, Stanley Bemba, Balam Jemukasa, Oliecho Gwara Quail from Lango, David Nabeta, Marjorie Mukasa, the daughter of Sisonkole, These people took a bold decision at that time to make a choice in politics when the future was not so certain but they believed in the responsibility of working for a united harmonious Uganda regardless of political and, and tribal differences. Mr. Yanyima was an inspiration, was a champion for legitimate opposition. As everybody well knows, and as so much was said yesterday about, about his own conduct in Parliament, during the troubled times between 1964 in particular, in 1971, when there was an onslaught on opposition parties in this country, following beliefs in the salvation of Africa through a single party rule, sparked off by Kwame Nkrumah in Ghana, embraced in East and Central Africa under the Mulungushi Club precepts, where it was considered illegitimate to be in politics outside the ruling party. 
And when, as Mr. Nation has testified, majority of members in the opposition at that time in this country fell by the wayside and abandoned their political parties and joined en masse the ruling party for favors or out of fear of consequences, Yanima stood firm. That by the end of Obote one regime, he stood along with three others left on the opinion benches, namely Alija Latim, Gino Obonyo, and Martin Okero. There had been 24 DP members elected in 1962. 1971, only four were left standing, and Yanima was one of them, and is now the last to go. Fortunately, in his case, he's gone naturally. He has changed the station. Hopefully, to another station may be a more reliable, more dependable, and more pleasing station. The others left by gunfire, not because of any conviction against them, but because they were persecuted for not being, not falling in line with the state, the regime in power. Mr. Anima is a success story of a professional turned politician. And here I wish to present his legacy in this regard as a challenge to current professionals in this country at this time. We don't have much to go into details. From what Mr. Nechun has said, you can, read, you can make a reading and say, Uganda is in troubled times now. From the evidence, you get everyday newspapers. You can see quite clearly that Uganda is in troubled times. From the evidence we, get, we gather from other countries around the world, when there are such signs of trouble in countries, changes are imminent. But unguided changes can create even more troubles. And I think the Anima sensed this in 1960. And a few may, may people have mentioned at that time who are well contained by the situation, had good jobs, good income, well received in the society. But they made a change. They, they took decisions to be involved in guiding the changes that were due. And this was, was beneficial to the country. At this time, I would like to plead to our people to have similar courage, the professionals, the businessmen, even the young. It is time to make a choice as Benjamin made. Don't be on the, don't continue sitting on the fence. You've got to get involved somehow. Make a choice. You've got a number of political parties around. Make a choice. If you're unsatisfied with what you have around, start a party. 
start your own parties, but get involved and guide the change. I think in Bianima we find an example, we find a guiding star. I wish to express the sincerest condolences to the family and I wish to commend a country we never respect and to pray for the soul of Mr. Benyema to rest in time of peace. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Samogere. So we are now uh, going to hear the words from the family, the two family members, and uh, we will start with Anthony uh, Bianima. Anthony, please come and say a few words, and then uh, Honorable Winnie Bianima will conclude. And the clock is ticking, uh, being reminded. Thank you. Uh, the bishops, distinguished guests, and especially Honorable Nichon. I'm sorry I reached you late. It's because I did not have your number. But uh, fortunately, I got in touch with your son, Jimmy and uh, he got in touch with you. Thank you very much for coming. I know how this is very important for me because I know how much my father respected you. I had written uh, a speech. I sat down on my computer and I wrote and I wrote a very beautiful speech. Then I woke up in the middle of the night and I tore it up. I just tore it up. I just felt it was not, it was not me. It was not from my heart. It was not from... Uh, I scribbled something else which I felt is what I wanted to say. My father, whom we like to call chairman, my rock, the rock that I have been standing on all these years has slipped away. I'm now on my own. But what is that rock? Who and what was my father? My father was very many things. He was a husband. He was a father. He was a teacher. He was a rancher. He was a politician. He was also a businessman. But very many people are also these things. So what made this very rural Mohima boy who was born in a very rural place where no medicines, no hospital, nothing to an educated people people were not baptized What made this man rise to a point where the entire nation gives him such an honor at his funeral? I don't think I'll ever be able to answer this. I don't think I'll ever be able to answer this question. I'm not that deep, perhaps. But I know a few attributes about my father which I admired 
and which I try very hard to emulate. Probably some of these attributes are what made him rise to this level. Humility. My father was a very humble person. You can even say that he was very uncomfortable with the high and mighty, with the rich and powerful. You'd always even find excuses to avoid being near them. He was more comfortable with simple village people in his home area of Nyamshozi, with his relatives, like the late Kajungu, like the way them was in my memories those are the times when I, I, I would see my father really happy and comfortable but interestingly the rich and the powerful the high and mighty were always looking for him this is something I, I did not understand when I was still young. I saw ministers, I saw presidents, I saw tycoons, I saw bishops, name it, frequent our home very many times, looking for him, sitting with him, talking to him. But I never, I never, not even once, I never saw my father going to visit any of them. Never. In fact, I don't think my father has ever visited anybody who is not his relative in the village. Really, I've never. If he did, I was not there. Now as an adult, I understand this attribute. My father told me, I think maybe a year or two ago, something which made me probably made me understand this my father told me that the best power is power that comes to you not power you desperately fight for but what do we see today we see people selling their houses to go and buy votes we see people going to money lenders borrow money to go and campaign what kind of power can you get from that kind of effort the other attribute my father was true to himself he was a man of very strong beliefs and no one not his wife not his children not his friends You know, I'm not even sure that my father had friends. Really, I can't remember my father telling me that this is my friend. I've never, I don't know, maybe. Anyway, not any of those people could change his mind once it has been made. He was very rigid with his beliefs, but he will not force his beliefs on anyone. He was tolerant to a point where it could even be annoying. It was not uncommon to find my father in deep argument with a drunk employee at his ranch, trying to make him understand his point. Sometimes that would make me angry. But he, my father, if there's one thing he believed in, very strongly is that everyone is entitled 
to their opinion, to their view. But what do we see today? We have even seen families being torn apart because of simple and silly things like politics. The other attribute, generous. My father was not a very rich man, but he believed that his wealth was for a purpose, not an end in itself. He shared. God knows how many medical bills my father has been paying, even at this advanced age of his. He would go to his house in Imbarara, now in his 90s, and you'd find a line of people waiting for him to give them money to go to the hospital, waiting for, for him to give them money for school fees. He was so generous to a point where people even took advantage of it. Just recently, a trader stole 70 million shillings from him because my father somehow trusted him and he wanted, as he said, he wanted to help him. I got this man arrested and my father even threatened to go to the police and get him released because he said, no, he's just a poor young boy. He was trying to earn a living. Please, he's not his lesson. No, he was like that. My father was also not religious. My father really did not believe a lot in religions. From a very early age, he used to tell me that we are all God's people. In fact, one Sunday he'd go to the Catholic Church, the Sunday he'd go to the Anglican Church, and some days he'd even go to a mosque. When I was getting married, I am a Catholic, but my wife is Anglican. And uh, some people in my family, especially the girls, are very, very religious. They were not very happy that I was going to be wedded in, a, in the Anglican church. And I got frustrated. So I went to my father. My father said, Look, I am Anglican, I wedded your mother in the Catholic Church. What's wrong with you wedding your wife in an Anglican Church? Then he told me something. He was always, he'd crack jokes sometimes. He said, by the way, do you know these religions, people are just shouting, dying, trying to kill each other for, they're just as old, slightly older than Kabombora. Kabombora was his brother who, had, who died at 100. He said, this is something which is just came here recently. People should not take it as a matter of life and death. Lastly, I want to say this. And I am saying this because it is what I think my father would have done in similar circumstances. Because my father did not like my father liked the truth. Yesterday we were in parliament. I saw politicians saying things about my father which are not true. I saw politicians claim to know things about my father which obviously they do not know. It made me sad.
I saw, I heard politicians saying things like the President Yuri Museveni was brought up by my father. That is not true. It's a lie. The President was not brought up by my father. I heard politicians saying things about my father's ranch which they don't know. I am privy to very many private things about my father. And really, at this sorrowful time, I want to ask politicians to control themselves and not try to use my father's name for their own plans. I will say more about this at our father's home. La lastly, yes, I can see one would stop. I want to say something about my siblings. No, Julius. But before I say get my siblings, you, you, it's very difficult to talk about my father without talking about politics. So I'm, I'll not be myself if I don't finish this. But I just want to say that at my father's home, and I've told you I was very privy to my father's Even thinking. I even have recordings because I, I kept recording him. Sometimes he'd even tell me to record him and he'd tell me very, very many things. And tomorrow at my father's house, I would like to share them with some people. And that's why I'm telling some politicians to be careful what they say because they might end up looking like they didn't know what they were talking about. To my siblings, recently, and this I told to my, some of them, I've told them before, we, I was with my father and uh, we met a lawyer, one of his friends, and his lawyer told me, my father said, oh, you are so lucky, you, you have got um, good children, uh, you've got, they will fit in your shoes, you're speaking in Rinyakori. My father turned around, looked at me, and he laughed, he laughed, and he laughed. So the lawyer was, was from this room, said, Muzi, why are you laughing? I said, said, these ones. And I said, yes. He said, no, none of these ones can fit in my shoes said, but kwa kugita ujere wabu buwana 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 babu gita baka utera na mubwa kwa sakiko mchikito chanji that if they add all their little feet together maybe they might fit in my shoes I told my brother that and he understood what my father was saying. My siblings, I, my father used to tell me a few things, he used to tell me, in summary, you have one brother, always, always be very close to him. If you have an argument, and you can't reach an, agree an agreement, let him be the winner because he's younger than you. I have tried to do that. 
He has told me, you have got sisters. Some of them are very emotional. Some of them are very opinionated. Some of them are very wary of you. He said, be patient with them. Always told me that, be patient with your sisters. I'll try to follow my father's advice. Thank you very much. Thank you, Anthony. So we'll now ask uh, Honorable Winnie Bianima to come and say a few words, and uh, the clergy are waiting their time, so you have the challenge. My Lord Bishop, the Reverend Prince Wasaja, and Princess, our daughter, the daughter of the late Matia Nsuboga, Abeb Tiwa, President General of the Democratic Party, all dignitaries here, the government representative, Minister Mruli, family, friends, have been asked to keep it short. I'll keep it short and sweet. I stand here with a sense of gratitude, also sadness, but with pride, as well as joy, to say farewell on behalf of my siblings to our father. We are six siblings. We used to be seven. The eldest is my sister Edith, sitting there. I'm the second born. Anton is the third. Actually, not the third. The third was our brother Bernard, who passed away in 2006. Anton is the fourth. Then Martha. Then Abraham and the last born, Olivia, and we have our spouses and our children. My father has left grandchildren. <clears throat> I start to pay tribute to him. So much has been said about him that I would not like to add and add, as Honorable Nechon has said, it turns into flattery when you say too much. But I wanted just to pay tribute to him one as a nationalist, and say that that's also his big legacy, that to us, his children, and to the whole country, he leaves us that legacy of being truly nationalist, loving your whole country, not loving just your tribe or your religion, but loving the whole country. As when he was at Budo, as you have heard, his friends, among the friends he kept talking about and he kept a relationship with post-Budo were the Honorable Daudi Ocheng, Professor Sente Zakajubi, the late Paulo Sebalu, the late Hannah Lule. I remember as a child, always our stop for coffee was at Hannah's Cafe on Kampala Road in the 70s. So his friends, in our house, wherever we, we went with him, we are from all parts of Uganda. At Makerere, I'd love to share with you this story. He told me that in the dormitory, they were living in dormitories. The next person in the dormitory to him was his friend, Asteriko Chiwana Sibirwa. They had completely different lifestyles. My father was a disciplinarian. He never drank. He never went out in the evenings. He was studious. He was always in the dorm. His friend, the late Chiwana, liked a good life. He was very brilliant, but he'd go out, he'd have a drink, he'd come home late, and they were friends. Now, one night, 
his friend, the late Chiwa, now comes home to the dorm, had had a few drinks, collapsed in his bed, and slept. But because my father was always sober, in the night he heard people coming in. And then he saw them carrying a can of something and they powered it all on the late Kiwana on his bed. And he then smelled a strong stench of petrol. So he got up very quickly from his bed and the people who had powered the petrol ran out of the dorm. So he woke up his friend and his friend got up and he was dripping in petrol. He saved his life. Whoever had poured petrol on him wanted to light a match. And he always was telling me this story about his friend Tiwana. And he saved his life. So we went to Gulu many times with him. He took us to Gulu. We slept in the house of the late Alexander Latim. We slept in the house of the Honorable Jean Obonio. For him, they were his political friends. He had friends. They were his political friends, political colleagues, and we shared family. And their children and them also came home and stayed with us in our house. He was a nationalist, so I encourage all of us to take this as his legacy too. Whether you are in politics or in academics or wherever, just learn, let's learn to embrace everything Ugandan in our lives, in our professions. Second, I want to pay tribute to him as a man who really, really believed in that motto of DP, truth and justice. He lived them. We've talked about how he talked truth to power. This was so important to him, to talk his truth. And in many ways, we, his children, he's taught us that. Every one of us knows how to raise their voice in our house. Everybody says their truth. And he spoke truth to power. And it came with many risks. And again, I want to challenge us all that to be truthful, to talk truth to power requires that there is freedom, that there are no risks to talking your truth. I see a country that has moved farther and farther away from that, where it is hard to talk your truth and to talk truth to power justice. You've heard from my brother. He really always was on the side of justice. He told us that he joined the Democratic Party because it was the party for the excluded. He felt strongly about inclusion, about non-discrimination about fairness for all. So he joined the Democratic Party because he saw that it espoused or fought or championed the rights of the excluded at the time. Today, I challenge DP, Democratic Party, that mission of championing the cause of the rights, raising the voice of the excluded is as valid today as it was in 1960 when he joined DP. Find your mission, DP. Find your mission. Determine who the excluded are, identify the excluded, and fight their cause. That is the challenge for DP. For the whole country, for the government of the NRM, Justice. Justice. For the church leaders, I challenge you too to stand on the side of justice. Look today, we have nurses and teachers who don't earn a living wage really. 
and we have members of parliament and ministers and presidents floating in money. That's not justice. That's not what he stood for. We have women dying in childbirth. 17 women every day die in childbirth because of lack of health care. And we have political elites flown out at millions of public money to be treated abroad. That's not justice. Today we have a drought in Uganda. There's drought. There are people who are hungry. We don't see a government that is closing down non-essential services and taking food to people who are suffering hunger. That's not justice. And to the church, you must speak up. When you don't speak up, then you're on the side of injustice. There's no neutrality on these issues. For my father, there was no neutrality. He spoke for justice, he acted for justice, and that's the legacy he leaves us. I want to pay tribute to him as a good parent. He had very, very good parenting skills that I don't have. I want always to learn from him. My father was a politician, but he was a man who, for him, seven o'clock, found him in his house, and from that moment on, every minute was for his children and his wife. Never went out for a drink, never went out to a club, never went out to do politics, as some people say. He stayed at home. He did homework with us. He took us for walks. He played the piano and we sang with him. And we're grateful for that. We should all be good parents to our children. We should give them time. We should make them love their country. He was a great parent. Now, to conclude, I want to thank very much the NRM government for choosing to honor our father. Thank you. Thank you, Democratic Party. For you, it is your pride, of course, and indeed, but still, we thank you, particularly Nobat Mao, for all the effort you have put into giving him this fitting tribute. To friends and family, friends particularly, who have been with us from the moment he breathed his last, who've worked so hard, flat out, to accompany him and us, thank you so much. And to family, you too, we don't take you for granted. Thank you for being there for us. So on behalf of my siblings, thank you all. Thank you, Honorable uh, Vianima. So uh, we again thank the clergy, we thank the church for everything that you've, been, uh, you've done to make this possible. We pass it on to you and we do apologize that we did, we did run over the time. Thanks again. Thank you. Turn to page 10. We sing that hymn, What a Friend. We have in Jesus at the bishop. Gets us a brief, brief sermon and a blessing.
in the name of God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Please do sit down. Uh, dignitaries from the central government, and I see many of you have turned up. Dignitaries from the government of Sabasajja Kabaka, I see also many of you are sitting here, and those of us from the church. Uh, I have been requested to stand in the position of the Right Reverend Kitio Ruwalida, Bishop of Namirembe Diocese. I have also been requested to stand in the place of His Grace, the Archbishop of our church. So, on behalf of the Church of Uganda, I would like to take this opportunity to welcome all of you who have been able to turn up for this very important uh, service, special service in our church. Thank you for coming. Uh, before we left the vestry, the dean of this cathedral asked me to give a sermon within five minutes. I did not reply. <laughs> But also ever since I was ordained, I have never given a sermon in five minutes. What am I saying? I shall make an effort to give a brief sermon. But thank you for turning up. I convey condolences and sympathy on behalf of our church to the family and to all of you who have been able to come and to the many who perhaps have not been able to come in order to honor this uh, uh, service. Uh, St. Paul's letter to the Romans chapter 12 and uh, verse 6, verse 7 and verse 8. That is the text on which I would like to preach. And I read, we have different gifts according to the grace given us. If a man's gift is prophesying, let him use it in a proportion to his faith. If it is serving, let him serve. If it is teaching, let him teach. If it is encouraging, let him encourage. If it is contributing to the needs of others, let him give generously. If it is leadership, let him govern diligently. If it is showing mercy, let him do it cheerfully. What is Paul teaching to us in this text which I have chosen? Paul is saying, all God's people, have been given gifts, or call them talents if you want. Why he gives you and me gifts or talents so that we may be able to utilize them for the benefit, for our benefit of course, but also for the benefit of others. This is why we are here. And your time and my time in this world, first of all, I have to find out which gifts God has given me. Once I know what those gifts are, my task is to utilize the gifts for the benefit of other people until God calls me home. So, many of you have come. Why have you come here? Today and in this moment. First, to give thanks and praise to God 
for the gifts which were given to Boniface Bianyuma, Bianyima. I hope I'm pronouncing the name correctly. <laughs> yeah, we must praise God. Why? Because uh, Boniface was able to know what his gifts are. And he was able to make an effort to utilize the gifts for the benefit of other people. I've uh, been listening to all of you who have been speaking here and also have been reading papers about uh, Boniface. It is clear that he has made a good contribution, very good contribution. He taught me also I'm a teacher. I was a teacher before I became a clergyman. I know about teaching. So I wanted to know, has this man taught? Yes, it is clear, because I don't know, but I think that uh, even if I don't ask you to put your hands up, some of you, I think, it is possible you were taught by this man. I think so. If not, many others, from what I've been reading in the papers, outside, were taught by this man. Uh, and my friend also, Kawanga Simogeriri. Yeah, I saw him speak here. Now I don't know where he's sitting. Uh, yeah, he's there. <laughs> I heard him speaking. And he said, this man uh, was happily married. I think that's a very important statement. Many of us attending this service are married. Will the people say, or can the people say now that this man is happily married? Well, Kawanga Semogere Mukuru was able to, to state and confidently because he knew. So, what is Boniface talking to you? If you are married and now you are listening stories about Boniface, check. Is there happiness in my marriage? If not, why? And what should I do in order to ensure that there is happiness, as was the case in Boniface Vianima's uh, marriage? So he's teaching. Boniface is teaching. I think that Wikitibwa uh, Kawanga also implied that this man had a home and a Christian home too. So you are here listening to Kawanga and others speaking. You ask yourself, do I have a marriage? Yes. Do I have a home? Yes. Is my home a Christian home? Do I have a marriage? Is it a Christian marriage? And if so, what are the principles that will ensure that when you have a marriage, it is a happy one? When you have a home, it is a happy home. I've been listening to the children here talking, and to many friends talking. And in the papers, I've been looking at the papers. You know them, uh, Monitor or Visiony. Even there is a ready paper. I don't know how many of you read the ready paper. It's there on the street. If you care to, to read, you will read. Plenty of things are there. I don't like many things which I see in the ready paper, but I think there is plenty of uh, news in that paper. And they are putting plenty of news on Boniface. Please look at it and also trace about those points mentioned here. Trace about the home, as Mukuru Kawanga was telling us. Is it true? I believe it is true. And this man is teaching you and me Kari, tuleme kugenda wala nyo, nalabudua, tedaji kazandi wa detano, vazi isi simanyi. But I think, uh, uh, what I'm saying is that uh, there is need for you and for me to know what gifts or talents God has given me. It is also important for me to know, am I 
utilizing these gifts for the benefit of other people. Nkula nganta di muama nyukula ba nti abantu ba ngi mbawele zaburungi nti bangali angebo di natuka na si mibwa kari mukoze burungi ba nyabo ni basebo kujia abantu ba sabasa jaka baka ba government imbala ba mukoze burungi ukujia abala angira muri wanuna mwe mukoze burungi ukujia na ba mbeja wimuri muri mukoze burungi ukujia ida ba tu ba ngani songa bweti mukole buri chemu sabola chona ukubera u kubanga tu chia inza ukuchikola na e ngathe bisebe bimu ebyayita kyabanga kizibu nyo i would like to kind of wind off what i have to say also naring the the warning given me before i started i would like to uh, to end with the words of psalm and psalm 23 many of you will know i believe those words so you are going to say together with me uh, those words of uh, of verse 6 and uh, psalm 23 so i'm requesting all of you please our dignitaries our language and our ambassador do stand I learned this psalm when I, because I went to Agri Memorial School near Kabakazi Lake there. And my teacher was Michara Chigozi. She taught me this psalm and I still know it. Those of you who are blessed to have learned this psalm, let us say it. We are going to say it in English because this service is in English. Now verse 6 goes like this. Please join me. Uh, uh, follow what I have to say. And uh, if you can together as i say those words mukuru uh, banja you can hear it to the congregation if you have an english bible surely goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life and i will dwell in the house of the lord forever glory be to the father and the son and the holy spirit amen